Good morning, Emmaus family and friends. This is week five of our series, Lies That We Tell at Church. I am grateful for each and every one of you who have been a part of this series, and I thank you for hearing what thus saith the Lord in this volume one of Lies We Tell at Church. I have a sneaking suspicion that I'm going to return to this again soon because I have still have more on my list. But our text this morning comes from John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, and I will read for you from the NIV and the message version. It goes this way. For God so loved the world that God gave God's only Son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send God's Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The message version says it this way. This is how much God loved the world. God gave his son, God's one and only son, and this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending God's son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was, but he came to help to put the world right again. Dear God, I pray that your spirit would rise up in me to speak your truth. I pray, Lord God, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. You are my strength and my redeemer, my soon coming king. I thank you, Lord God, in advance for your mercy and for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. A great theologian of old called St. Augustine, said these words to early Christians, and I quote, have a love for humankind and a hatred of sin. While this might not be familiar to many of us, you've probably heard it this way, boiled down over a couple hundred years, and it goes like this, love the sinner, but hate the sin. That's today's lie that we want to tackle and to actually see if it represents the heart of God. Now, I know when people say this, when many of us say this, most of us say this, we absolutely mean well. We're not trying to be mean-spirited. We feel like it's a very generous, a very progressive, understanding, welcoming, and embracing kind of phrase. It sounds religious, and it sounds reasonable because it has all those big Christian spiritual words in it, you know, like love, right, hate, sin. Some would even say that these three words can sum up the whole Christian faith. It's all about hating the sin and loving one another. Love, hate, sin. This sort of phrase gives us some kind of permission to create relationship when we don't approve of somebody's behavior or choice, and we can say, I still love you, but I don't like or I hate what you're doing. Because we want to stay in relationship and really love our friends and our families and the folks who are connected to us, and so we want to let them know, I still love you no matter what, except this over here I don't really like. Some would even suggest, well, pastor, I'm justified in saying it just like I said, because the Bible talks about love. The Bible talks about hate. Have you not read Proverbs 6 and 19? There are seven things that the Lord hates. Don't you know that Jesus said you even have to hate or disown your family in order to faithfully follow after him? And there is scripture and scripture upon scripture on sin. Of course, it's okay to love the sinner, but hate the sin. But this morning, I want to suggest that I don't think these things quite go together in the way that we imagine. I'm not sure that they actually represent the heart or the intention of God Almighty. This little phrase is probably a half-truth at best. So I first want to suggest that this doesn't really work, even if God thinks that this is a good idea, because the challenge is no matter how much we say those words, we are human, and we skip over the love part, and we go fast forward to the hate, the sin. We are actually perfectionists. We are proficient in identifying sin and telling people how we hate it and what they're doing, even if they don't dare to ask. We volunteer information. We're experts at identifying sin. And even if this formula works, we believe that it works because we are on the giving side of this love and not the receiving of the hatred. Indeed, Gandhi said it this way best, and I quote, hate the sin and not the sinner is a precept which, though easy to understand, is rarely practiced. And this is why the poison of hatred is spread in the world. How do you think it feels for someone to say, I love you, 
but I hate the sin. As I was doing my research on how many times this phrase comes up, most often, and you can figure it out yourself, this phrase comes up, love the sin, hate the sinner, when folks are engaging our brothers and sisters in the LGBTQIA movement. That is the first thing people say, I love the sinner, but I hate the sin. How does it feel that all of you can't be loved? Gandhi says it doesn't even work this way. So that's the first reason we all not to say that, because we all know how to do it. We end up hating the sinner and hating the sin, and love is pushed away. Which brings me to my next point I want to suggest today on this, why this doesn't work and it's not a true. One, it's not true because we don't even do it if it was true. But the second thing is when we approach this whole idea of love the sinner and hate the sin, we are forgetting a very important part of our Christian journey. Before we do any of that, we ought to perceive the plank in our own vision. The scripture says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 2 to 4, listen, before you go out telling other people about their sin, before you figure out if you hate it or love it, first you need to stop judging other people and judge or evaluate yourself. That's what the text says, that even Jesus Christ the Savior did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, might have a better life. Beloved, we have become too proficient in judgment and condemnation. We find sin and let people know that they are sinners. The scripture says that this is in Matthew, the gospel, and I love it. It says, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother or sister's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother or sister, let me get the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? Beloved, when we say love the sinner and hate the sin, it is kind descending and it is arrogant and it positions us as superior and somebody else as inferior. We do not have the right to engage people like that. Beloved, can I tell you this? That righteousness is not the same as being right. And so often we are committed to being absolutely right, to have these rules and regulations that we believe are the ones that we forsake the God who calls us not just to be right, but to be righteous, loving in a relationship. Newsflash, Emmaus families and friends, some of us are postmodern Pharisees. We have memorized all the rules in the book. And we are walking around in our offices, our schools, our places of work, writing down and citing people for every violation in these hundreds and hundreds of laws that we have memorized for them. Don't be a postmodern Pharisee. You're way up here and everybody else is way down here. The Bible tells a story of a, of, of a person, a Pharisee, who went to pray. And the Bible tells it in John chapter 8. It says this. It said there was a Pharisee who went to pray. And then there was another guy who went to pray who wasn't learning, who recognized he was righteous. And I love the way the Bible says it. And I won't go through all of it. But the Bible says they both went to pray. The Pharisee said, oh, God, I am so grateful I am not like this heathen over here. I am so grateful, God, that I have followed all of your rules and regulations. And I know, God, you will answer and hear my prayer because I am right. And the other guy, my paraphrase, says it this way. God, I know I'm wrong. Can you just have mercy on me? Can you just give me some grace, Lord God? And the scripture says that God commends the guy who was honest, who refrained from judging, who recognized his own sinful state and recognized that God was the giver of mercy. Don't be like the Pharisee, so glad that you got it right, so eager to make sure that other people know that they have it wrong. Love the sinner, but hate the sin. So, so I want to go back to that text Again, in that saying we hear in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. I know we tend to rush to this whole part that God had to come through Jesus Christ to redeem the sins of the world. And that's right. And God came so that we could be in right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I get that. But can I just say something in my study that blew my mind? Jesus never tells us to love sinners. He doesn't call us sinners. 
Jesus commands us to love our neighbor. Do you see the nuance there? Jesus says, if you could just love your neighbor as yourself, that's what Matthew chapter 22 says, verse 36, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like this, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and all the prophets hang on these two commandments. See the difference, beloved. Jesus calls us neighbors. That's the first commandment. And look how we've twisted it. Jesus said, love your neighbor. And we said, no, no, no. We have already decided that our neighbor is a sinner. So I can skip the neighbor part and go straight to the sin and condemnation. Beloved, I've come to tell us that Jesus sees us first as the beloved, as the worthy, as the precious, not as useless rascals. That does not mean we don't do everything right, that we do everything right. But we tend to see people... We do tend to see people primarily by their greatest mistake or their lowest point or their worst decision or their most painful shortcoming. And Jesus says, no, I want you to see everybody first as neighbor through the lens of love. Jesus celebrates our humanity and doesn't magnify our depravity. But we who are the friends and followers of Jesus, we reject that kind of love and accept its embrace for other people and even ourselves. We continue to put labels on people, demonize people, ostracize people, and other people, even though Jesus calls them friend. How different would the world be if we allowed and followed the lead of Jesus and saw people first and foremost as the beloved of God, as our neighbor? That's what that text says in John 3, 16. I know we rush through the whole part that we're sinners, but look into the text. For God so loved the cosmos that the whole reason Jesus came was out of a deep abiding love for all of creation. What would it look like if we let love lead us? So can I change that phrase a little bit? Instead of love the sinner and hate the sin, I want to change it to love the neighbor and hate the sin. But then I want to push us a little further about the hate the sin part. But because when I read the Bible in John chapter 8, it says this, as Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, he appeared again in the temple where all the people were gathered around him. And here the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery, and they made her stand before a group. She was a sinner, right? And they said, Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And they were using the question as a trap, as a basis to accuse him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they came kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said, let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And the Bible says he stooped down and rolled on the ground again. And all those who heard it began to walk away one at a time. The older one first until only Jesus was left. And with the woman still standing there, Jesus straightened her up and said, woman, where are they, those who accuse you? Has no one condemned you? She replied, no one, sir. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Beloved, look at the order. Jesus does not talk about the sin until he shows himself as a lover of the woman. Do you see the order? We rush to the sin first, and then if people do what we want them to do, then we might issue love, grace, and mercy. But if we follow the lead of Jesus, he starts with love as the motivation, and then he says, now, by the way, I'm going to need you to stop sinning. See, love first, then accountability to sin. But, beloved, when we say that phrase, love the sin or hate the sin, we jump to the sin first and we forget that love is the way. The truth of the matter is people don't repent because you tell them about their sin. People repent when they've been overcome and overwhelmed by the abiding love of God that we show. Then there's space on the table to say, hey, this right here doesn't work so well. So today, beloved, I just want to celebrate this notion that we ought to be motivated by love. And the sin, the repentance, will take care of itself. Because if someone knows that you love them first unconditionally no matter what, then they can assess their lives and make decisions that can change and line up with what we best believe God says. Love. 
I remember this movie called The Shack. Many, many people saw the movie years ago and read the book. And there's a scene in that story that I absolutely love. If you remember the movie, um, it's a scene where Mackenzie, the guy who has lost his daughter brutally, he's so upset and he goes back to the shack um, as he is remembering his daughter. And he has this experience where he runs into Papa, his representative guy. And I love it because a uh, guy's a black woman, so it's really, really cool. But nonetheless, and so she goes to this place and talks to Sophia, who is wisdom and represents the spirit. And this is line. Here it is. It says the father in the movie is especially fond of you. And what would it look like if we could all have those kind of encounters with God and God's people? That we walk away with every encounter, people understanding and believing that God is especially fond of you. Not that God is fond of you over somebody else, but God has a special love for you. That's the way that God leads. God leads from a place of love. For God so loved the world that God sent God's only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now, I know people are saying, oh, Reverend, if we love people like that, they will go wild. There is no accountability. I'm not talking about that. That's not love if you have people that are not accountable. But I am suggesting that if we show people the deep abiding love of God first, Everything else will line up. So when I look back to that little phrase, love the sinner and hate the sin, I just want to say one thing. Love, period, hard stop. That's all we need to say. That's the truth. The truth of all of this is love. We must refrain from stuff that is abiblical, that's not good news, that is not gospel, that is bad theology, and that is bad grammar. Because if the opposite of love is hate, the opposite of sin is not sinner. See, it don't work in any kind of way. The love that God calls us to cannot be relative. It must be expansive. And it cannot only be given to those we're connected to and approve of. This love must be sacrificial. That's what Jesus did. This love must be soothing and calming. This kind of love must build community. Beloved, this is the truth that God is calling us to. Stop holding people hostage to your approval and release the love of God. Because for God so loved the world that God presented God's son, Jesus the Christ. And whoever believes in him, whoever loves like him, will have eternal life. The good news of the gospel, love, period. Hard stop. Don't add nothing to it. Don't take nothing.